This is a video that I've been wanting to make for a very long time, literally years. And with YouTube's copyright infringement stuff, I've always really been hesitant to do this. So what I've done is I've made this video not monetized, first of all, to hopefully get around some of that. There's a very good chance that if you are watching this on playback, that some of what I'm about to discuss may be muted, meaning that the songs I'm going to play may be muted. And, uh, you know, if if you'd like to help out with Super Chats or, you know, to help me kind of get over not doing monetization, you can use the generic affiliate links in the description below. That would be cool. If not, whatever. That's fine. Um, so the topic of this video is going to be focused on some, not all, but some of the various tracks that I use to demo different sound systems with, what I'm listening for, in particular, tonality, timbre, the sounds, imaging, focus. And really, when I talk about imaging, I'm going to do something that you may not have seen before. It's pretty cool. I've got some links in the description to how you can also do it as well, if you'd like to. But I think... I'm just going to dive right in. And again, this isn't everything that I use. I vary a lot of my music depending on what I want to listen to at the time. And the reason that I have so many different tracks is because some music will highlight a specific issue that another particular track may not. And you'll notice the one thing that I do not have in my music is I don't have the the standard, I guess, audiophile type music, which is mostly jazz or classical. That's that's the audiophile type music. But most of the people that I know that listen to stereo systems, most of them, not all of them, but most of them don't really listen to that kind of music. They listen to stuff that they're familiar with and stuff they, you know, want to rock out to or something along those lines. And I'm no different. And I've grown up through the years listening to same many different songs and I've heard them on probably hundreds of different systems at this point come to be familiar with them and certain things I'm going to key into so I'm going to go ahead and dive in what I've got up on screen that I'm showing you is Spotify now let me actually get rid of this for one second and make a, a brief note because I've discussed this before there's a thread on DIY mobile audio where I talked about the danger of different mixes and masters of the same song. So for example, a lot of the HD track music that you go and download in high definition or high resolution, at least at that time when I wrote the article, which is like around 2013 or so, a lot of those albums were high resolution versions of remasters. And one in particular that drove me insane was Rage Against Machines' self-titled album. If you have the original disc, which I think it's 1992, can't remember the exact year, but if you have the original, it's a great album for sound quality. And it's just, it's Rage Against Machine. I mean, freaking love it anyway. It was remastered by the folks at Audio Fidelity, which I have a copy of, and it's an incredible version. If you want to go find that, you can't, I don't think you can find it new, but you can find it on the used market. That's the only remaster to get. The Audio Fidelity remaster of Rage Against Machines self-titled. That's the one to get. There's many, many other remasters and most of them are squished in terms of dynamic range and equalization. Some of it may be better, some of it may be worse, but the dynamic range of them is just terrible. I mean, it's just, there's no range to it. There's no dynamic range, tons of compression. Circling back to the HD track stuff, that's what they use. They use the remastered one with high compression, very low dynamic range. And so, for example, let's say that you are sharing your system with a friend and you say, hey, bring over whatever you want. I want you to listen to whatever you want, because that's what music should be, or that's what demo should be. It shouldn't be you forcing somebody to listen to something that you think is great. Tell them to bring their own stuff and get a demo with their own favorite songs. And then if you want to, after, play some of your favorite tracks. But let's say they bring over a copy of Rage Against Machines, self-titled, remaster from like 2012 or 2005 or whatever. 
and it's a very poor remaster. And they're thinking, oh, this, this, I'm not really impressed by this. Some of it could be because they're listening to a really crappy album and you're used to listening to a much better version. Or conversely, maybe they're only listen, used to listening to that version and you play them your version and they're like, oh my God, it sounds so much different. That's a real thing that can really happen. And sometimes what I see in the audio community is somebody will say, you know, I heard this speaker with this song at a show and it sounded way better than I've ever heard that song before. And they automatically attribute it to the speakers, never minding like the blind listening aspect of it or the sided bias. And sometimes it goes the other way. But when it could actually be that they're listening to a different version, a different master of that song than they're used to hearing, we're littered with all these different ones. And I'm saying all that because when I show you my Spotify playlist, it's just the songs that we're listening for. It's not necessarily the master version because I don't know what version some of these are. For example, the second track on here is Steve Winwood, Higher Love. I've got a mobile Fidelity Sound Lab version of that. Their version, their master is so much better than the original and better than some of the remasters that came after it. That's my gold standard. That's the disc that I use, but I'm just going to show you the song, kind of give you an idea of what I'm listening for. And again, I want you to keep in mind that the masters make the difference. And, and that's really as far as I'm going to get into that topic, because that truly could be an entire video on its own. But actually, I do want to say one other thing before I forget. Another really good example of that is Dire Straits Brothers in Arms. If you compare the original release to the Mole Fidelity Sound Labs, because I've seen the actual data, if you will, the spectrum plot, they actually sound different. And it's not one of these ethereal things like, oh, it, like I don't know, the paint peeled off the walls. It was so much better. Literally, the master is different. 80 hertz has about 3 dB more punch to it on the remaster from Mobile Fidelity Sound Labs. And there's a couple key areas in the higher frequencies. I want to say it's like four or five kilohertz that have been EQ'd a little bit. So there are clear differences in certain tracks that I was able to analyze from the original versus that remaster. So those kind of things also exist too. And it's worthwhile for me to note that because it really does factor into your perception of a sound system because you may not know which version you're hearing. Okay. I'm, I'm going to leave that one alone. All right. So we'll start off with this playlist and I will try to remember to link it in the description below. But we're going to start from Depeche Mode. Enjoy the silence. Going now. All right. So on the right channel, what you're going to hear is the extra synth sound, and it's a little bit of a bite. It's like an electric sound is the best way I can describe it. So you're going to hear that punch from the kick drum or the synth, really. And then you're going to hear on the right channel, you're going to hear that synth sound. Okay, so that's what I was talking about. If you have like an unresolving system, meaning that if you have a system that has higher distortion through the mid-range, you may not quite hear that little bit of a detail. Conversely, if you have a system that maybe is a little bit too bright, then it's possible that you're going to hear it, but maybe you shouldn't hear it at quite the level that you need to. So that's something to kind of pay attention to and, and say like, all right, does that sound like it's at a reasonable level? And for things like that, you really do. Unfortunately, you need a reference. And that's why I was saying earlier, I use these headphones. They're not the gold standard, but I know that the mid-range is good. And I know that the high frequency, I think it's around like four to six kilohertz, somewhere in that range is boosted anywhere from three to five decibels, depending on whose data you see. And so I got a good idea that it's about almost twice as loud or half as twice as loud, somewhere in that range. So that's something you can kind of pay attention to. The next one I'm going to go to again is Higher Love. Steve Winwood. So a couple things actually. One is the air. It just sound like you hear room in that track, but the snare doesn't quite have the same sound initially. And I'll try to tell you where to listen for that. So I'm going to start it back over. That third one, 
that third, dun -dun -dun. listen for that. It'll be a little bit different. It's a little bit higher, right? So the first two are a little bit lower an octave, and that third one is a little bit higher an octave. And that's something that if you can hear that difference, that's good. You should hear a difference because it's not the exact same. One more time. You hear it? Okay, so listen for that when you're listening to this track. Now, it's gonna get into the, the I call it like a bass roll, like the intro drum, and it'll go doo -doo 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 -doo. Depending on your system, you'll hear the lower bass from it. And I think, like I said earlier, I think it goes down to about 40 hertz. I'm not exactly sure. I need to test this track. But a good system, a good, I would say a good set of bookshelf speakers that get down to 50 hertz anechoic will do a decent enough job of having that lower bass portion of this. So I'm going to play it. I'm going to let it keep playing. Did you hear that initial doo -doo 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 play that again? Right here. Think about it. Like a tom. I don't know exactly what that is, or it almost like a steel drum sound. I'm not a hundred percent sure. I'm not guys, I'm not a musician. I'm being honest with you. I tried. I'm not good at it. <laughs> so, but that's what I'm listening for. Uh, I'm gonna skip to magic. Okay. And hey, Jeff P. Third is a rim shot with more laying in on it. Yes. Thank you. All right. So the next one I'm going to play for you is Magic by the Cars. And what you're going to listen for is he's going to go, or yeah, there it is. I got stuck on the Steve Winwood track. It'll be in the left. Just listen for that. Okay. That, that, now that should be left hand. And that's what I was saying was when you hear that, on your speakers, that will help you to find the acoustic boundary, the left and right acoustic boundary. So I'm gonna play it one more time, just real quick. So that was it. So listen for that when you're listening for, or, or this particular track. And again, that will help you kind of get an idea. And one thing that I like to do is I'll close my eyes and I'll just sit back and I'll just kind of listen got to relax. Don't like tense up while you're trying to listen critically and just enjoy the music. First of all, listen, close your eyes. And when you hear it, just like this point to it with your hand and then open your eyes and see where you're pointing and see if you're pointing outside of the speaker. Most speakers radiation widths about plus or minus 60 degrees for most bookshelf type speakers with a tweeter on a flat baffle. If it's a horn speaker, it might not be quite as wide. But you can expect to be pointing, you know, probably a few feet outside of the speaker if it's got reasonably wide radiation. Okay. Now, uh, let's see here. Go. Oh. Know your enemy. Rage against the machine. Classic. When you play that track and you've got your subwoofer and your mid bass dialed, I hear people talk about slam. Now, I've never used that. I've never used the term slam, but that's that slam. That mid bass, that attack, that, I mean, that hits you right in the chest, you know? And if it's got high dynamic range, meaning that if you're listening to it at low volume or if you're listening to it at high volume and you've got high dynamic range, that kick will punch you in the chest. And if you want to check for dynamic range, listen to it at low volume, you're going to have, decent dynamic range. Most every speaker has decent dynamic range when you're listening at low volume. So listen at low volume, listen for that intensity of that punch. Now, turn it up a good bit higher. I would say, well, I don't want to tell you how high to listen to, but turn it up a good bit higher, start it over again, 
and see if it still has that same intensity. It's going to be louder. Let's see if it still has that same punch. If it's a smaller bookshelf speaker or maybe a tower speaker that just doesn't have the ability to get low or get loud or just doesn't have high dynamic range, then you're not going to feel that same intensity as you did at lower volume. And that's one of the things that I test for when I do testing of speakers is compression. And that really is just testing the dynamic range. It's testing the speaker's response at a low volume, 76 decibels at one meter. And then I do it at 86, 96, and then 102 decibels. And what I'm checking for is, does the frequency response change as I increase the output of that speaker? And an ideal speaker, the response won't change at all, if you went up to infinity. I mean, that's not ever going to happen, but in theory, if you went up to infinity volume, is there such a thing as infinity volume? That response would not change, and that would mean that you have incredible dynamic range. But the problem that most speakers have is that at around 96 decibels, certainly at 102 decibels, the woofer is giving out. There's a lot of external port noise. And because of that, you don't have the dynamic range on the low end. And sometimes... I've even seen cases where you'll run into dynamic range issues, not even sometimes, a decent bit. You'll run into issues in the dynamic range near the crossover on the tweeter end. So if you go look at my data, that's what you'll see when I talk about compression. That's what I'm listening for. Tell your mama. I like that. I just like this track. Listen to it for a second. Right. What I like to listen for in this track is... Nora Jones is center, but there's somebody, I don't know if it's her voice just also copied over and panned off to the left, but it's on the left. So listen to that. When it opens up, you'll definitely hear it. You hear that? I mean, I hope that you did. Now, when you might or when it might be harder to discern that there are two distinct voices, one on the left and then one at the center. And if, if I'm backwards from you guys, I apologize, but it's my left. So I guess I'm going right. So I should do this. Hopefully you understand that. If you don't hear two very distinct voices, then that's an indication of poor setup, poor integration, probably most likely poor imaging precision of your speakers. Imaging precision comes from, in my experience, two things, one of two things, or, or both at the same time. Frequency response matching between speakers, a set of speakers. So you can imagine that if you have a set of speakers and one is, let's just give an extreme example. The response is six decibels lower than the other one. I know that's an extreme, right? Then what's going to happen is you're going to hear an imbalance. The center vocalist, they're not going to be center between the speakers. They're going to be panned over more toward the louder speaker. Now, realistically, what happens is there's frequency response deviations from speaker to speaker. Really good speakers can stay, I would say, within plus or minus one decibel. That's, that's really good. Even raw drivers sometimes don't even do that. Even the best of the best raw drive units don't even do that sometimes. When you have those deviations, let's say there's a there's a dip at four kilohertz on one speaker, but there's not on the other speaker. Or maybe there's a dip at two kilohertz on one speaker and not on the other speaker. So everything is going to sound similar. It's going to sound centered, I should say. But then at those particular frequencies, there's going to be an image shift and it's going to split out and it's going to, it might sound phasey. It depends on what you would define it as phasey. I don't think I would call it phasey, but I could see how one might call it that. But you can just listen for the intensity differences between the speakers. If it sounds like everything is dead center and the vocalist is singing, and then all of a sudden it drifts to one speaker hard at a particular frequency, for like example, sibilance, four kilohertz, you might have some sibilance there. And all of a sudden it's just jumping out. What you would probably find is that the speaker's responses aren't matched between the two pair or between the two in the pair. The other thing is then, well, within that, it can also be a room if you have an asymmetrical room. So maybe you've got the speaker pair set up kind of in a corner. One's closer to a wall and the other one doesn't have a wall next to it. You're going to have a frequency response imbalance at your seated position. 
But the other thing that I've noticed is that wider radiating speakers, especially omnidirectional speakers, don't have the same imaging precision as a set of speakers with more narrow radiation, maybe something like a wave guided speaker that has radiation pattern about plus or minus 40 degrees. Okay. Now these are general things that I've come to find out. It doesn't mean that an omnidirectional speaker can't image well, but it's going to sound more diffuse than something that has a more narrow radiation pattern. And then you factor in the room, things going on in the room, those matter as well. So let's see here, getting back to this particular track, and again, playing that. I won't cry for you. If you don't hear those two distinct voices, then there's probably, probably something going on with the imaging precision of the speakers. And it's probably either the room effect, maybe you've got the speakers set up asymmetrically, or the response matching between the set is not really quite good. Uh, another one that I really like to listen to. Wrapped around your finger by the police. That bass line, the way it just rides throughout the song, car audio especially is really problematic in mid-bass area between 100 hertz to 300 hertz. Home audio is problematic, but not quite as problematic. The car audio, what you tend to find is, are more resonances in panels and things like that. So when you play a good mid-bass guitar riff like that, where it's more focused on that sound and there's not quite as much going on in the track, at least for a little bit, if there's panels rat rattling or vibrating, or maybe if there's a resonance in an enclosure from a speaker, a home audio speaker, then you'll notice that sound light up. You'll notice that reverberation in a door panel in a console. You'll notice that reverberation in the speaker enclosure. It'll sound for a lack of better words, boomy. Usually boomy, I'm talking about 100 hertz and below, but let's just say for now, it's more resonant, more boomy. So again, that should just be like a mild riding tone throughout the song. And if it stands out, if it's it's supposed to sound like more like, mm, 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 mm. but if it sounds like, you got a resonant somewhere. So that's one thing that I listen for when I'm testing speakers as well. Let's see here. All right. This song is a cover and it's by Aloe Black. It's called I'll Take You There. But the initial kick of this song. Oh, oh, oh. Dude, oh, that, that kick when it comes out. I listened to this track for just the first 10 seconds just to hear that kick. I mean, I mean, come on, man. That's just too awesome. Oh, I mentioned Bruce Springsteen earlier when somebody, when Jeff had said this, hold on, about the Higher Love track, the rim shot. This Bruce Springsteen song, which is a little bit creepy. Yeah, I'll give it to you. There's that rim shot on the left, and there's the guitar that's on the right, my right, my left, your left, if you're playing this back later. Listen for that. What I like, and I'm I'm sure it's probably not real. I don't know if it's real room ambiance, but it sounds like there's ambiance to that rim shot that's off far left. So when I listen to this track, I'm listening for depth because I'm trying to figure out, okay, I know it's supposed to be panned to the left, but does it sound like it's behind the speaker or does it sound like it's right in front of the speaker? It's an illusion for sure. But good speakers that I've heard this song on have it behind the speaker on the left. Let's see here. I can't go through all of these for sure. Uh, if you like rap or if you don't like rap, then close your ears. The song. Headline ain't no limits how I shock ya. Hard chrome dates disappear when I drop her. All these haters disappear when... All right. For car audio, there's nothing better for me than driving down the road with my windows down, blasting that song because it's just... That, that that whole sound of that song is just awesome. So I know some of you, I've noticed in the home audio community, people really don't like rap. And I'm like, oh, God, you guys are missing out, man. There's some great songs. Uh, Lido Shuffle. 
I like listening to the tonality. Lost his voice here. Lido missed the boat that day. So when he enters in the song, he goes, Lido. And it's almost like taking a scoop out of his mid range. Not frequency response wise, but like the way he puts inflection in his voice, it goes, Lido. I love that. I think that's so cool. And poor speakers generally, I find, just don't do that that well. It's just more monotone. But the other thing is, is if the speakers aren't neutral through that lower mid range area, what I find is one of those, that particular range, one of those notes, either the low or the excursion from it, um, just doesn't sound right. So I'm going to play it again. So if you're just casually listening, you won't catch that at all. But if you are listening critically, you'll catch the way he says Lido. And again, a good set of speakers is going to have that inflection in his voice and it's going to make it apparent. It's not one of those things that like jumps out, smacks you across the face. You've got to be listening for it. Cherry Bomb. That initial snare. Come on, man. Now this one, let's see. If you guys have ever seen the movie Twins, you probably recognize this song because otherwise I doubt you, you've heard this song. This song has a lot of range in his because he's making all these sounds with his mouth and it's just so cool, man. Uh, this is the same guy for those of you who don't know, Bobby McFerrin, who's saying, don't worry, be happy. And I'm sure you're probably familiar with that song. So I like using it for that. Another one. Correlated pink noise. So what I do, correlated pink noise, I will listen to the music or listen to the pink noise. I'll sit between the speakers and I'll just start moving my head around. And what I'm listening for are phase anomalies, frequency response, drops, things like that. I'm trying to get a good idea of how well matched is the speaker pair because my room is symmetrical, so I know that the room doesn't really have its own issues in that regard. It's got other issues, but in that particular regard. So I'll play that track, and I'll just kind of move my head around. And what I'm listening for is, does it sound like, are there hot spots in it as I move my head within a small area? Now, if you start walking around, yeah, you're definitely going to hear it. It's not going to sound cohesive. But within a small area, small window, maybe about like this, just shifting your head around. It should sound similar. And this especially goes for those of you in car audio who will often tune to a generic curve. That's a big problem. It's another video topic. But I will say that, especially in higher frequency, where you've used kind of any kind of equalization to match the response between left and right, and home audio, this applies to you as well. You can very easily do the wrong thing with a single microphone method of measurement, where if you just place the mic at the headrest position or the seated position, and then do all your measurements based off of that. The wavelengths are so, so small and high frequency that moving the microphone even a, like a quarter of an inch can really change the response. So if you're basing all of your measurements off a single point location for high frequency, and I would say anything above one to two kilohertz, it's a really bad idea to do that. And then you're trying to match the two sides. Well, if you shift your head or the microphone a little bit one way or the other, everything goes out the window. Now your response matching no longer matching. So that's why it's very important to take a spatial average using multiple microphones, or you can use the moving mic method where you just move the microphone around, that kind of thing. Uh, money for nothing, that's just a, that's a gimme, right? I mean, we all, we don't all. But. So that synth drum, give me one second, has a, has a penchant in car audio because of the frequency range that it's in, a lot of car audio people will play their mid bass or front mid bass too low in frequency. And there's a strong hold in the response for most systems coming from the left mid bass or the driver's side mid bass mounted in the door. And what happens is you don't hear the full depth of that bass, that synth. And instead you hear a boom, 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 and it's, it's just like a, it's like the woofer's losing control of itself. And almost every system that I get into, I'll play this one track and I'll listen to it just the beginning of it. 
And if I hear that left mid bass going, boop, 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 I know that your crossover is not right between your subwoofer and your mid bass. I know you've got an issue there. And, and then I'll point that out and then I'll kind of go on about my way. Um, now, here's one that I, seriously, I don't know anybody else who's ever heard this song. And I'm not, it's not bragging. I'm just saying, like, it's a very obscure song, but it's by Adam Lambert. And some of you may know him from American Idol. Others may know him from, he's taken Freddie Mercury's spot on Queen taking Freddie Mercury's spot. But yeah, he's the lead singer for Queen as they tour now and have been for a while. But this song, um, I don't necessarily consider it a sound quality song per se, but I listen to it because it's got a lot of stuff going on. It's produced by Pharrell, I believe, of the Neptunes, in case any of y'all wonder. So? Well, I was walking for some time When I came across this sign Saying, who are you and where are you from? About to kick in. don't like when visitors come No trespassing, and that's what it said that is some of the tightest space. Now, that Aloe Black song, the I'll Take You There that I talked about earlier, this song to me rivals that. I just, it's super tight and I love listening to it for that. Uh, here's another one, Chasing Pirates by Nora Jones. This is the last one on my list, at least for right now. Yeah, a little left here. Very faint. I wonder if y'all can hear that particular sound. So listen for that because it's very, very faint and a lot of systems, they'll have it, but it's it's not immediately noticeable. Now, now that I pointed it out, you'll probably notice it every time you hear it, but I'm listening for that. How well does that guitar feedback or that feedback sound show up in the track? And another thing that I want to do, and you guys will have to give me a second here while I set it up, is to do this. Okay. Now, no idea. I'm getting there. See here. Window. Window. All right. So I know that you can't hear what I'm playing right now because I realize that's a limitation. But this software is called Ozone. But so first of all, Audacity is what I'm using to load tracks into this software or into uh, being able to to listen back to the tracks. And then there's this thing called Ozone Imager, version two, I think now. And you can download both of these for free. They're in my description already if you want to go check them out. But what I what I do is I will load a track into this and uh, I will have to turn it down for myself real fast. Playback speed. Where's the volume at on here? There. Okay. So you guys can't hear it, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you what I'm listening for here. This is the Nora Jones track, Tell Your Mama. And in this window, what you're seeing is the contents of the music, and it's kind of mapping out where the sounds are being placed within the soundstage. This V shape, this triangle arc V shape thing right here in the center, from here to here and then around, that is everything that is in phase in front of you. And this would be your left speaker, meaning right here would be your furthest left speaker, hard pan to the left, or the furthest left sound, hard pan to the left. This would be your furthest right sound, hard pan to the right. Again, this is your in-phase area. Now, outside of this center area, the center wedge, are the left out of phase and the right out of phase. So what you would do is you would go and download this software, Audacity, and then you would download the Imager. You would load your song into Audacity. You would load up Imager, and then you would play the song and you would listen for okay it sounds like again this Nora Jones track had and what I would do is I would listen or I'm sorry I would listen while I'm watching and I would say okay well it sounds like somebody's on the left so I would expect this to light up over here and it sounds like somebody's in the center I would expect the center to light up if you go and listen to Michael Jackson's Thriller on this while you're watching it play back in that song he walks across the floor I think stairs from right to left and what you'll see is there's a clear shot of stripes going from right to left. But the interesting thing is that it doesn't go all the way to the left. It'll stop right here, which tells me that 
in the song, if I'm listening back on speakers, it won't go to the furthest left of the soundstage. And, and here's something that's kind of interesting about that. Before I knew that, I had always assumed that he walked entirely from right to left soundstage. So I used to say, okay, well, the left boundary is where his last footstep is. But that was wrong. And when I look back at the imager as a sanity check, I realized that he doesn't quite go all the way to the left edge. And he'll stop, you know, before that. I say he, I don't know whoever it was that was walking across the stage. So I always found that interesting. Um, another thing about this particular software is talking about the out of phase stuff. And I don't have the track on hand to show you, but Dire Straits, Money for Nothing, if I had a copy of it, I could show you what I'm talking about. At the beginning of that track, actually throughout, there's a whole lot of out of phase stuff. And that that track is really complex. So as you're listening back to it, you may say, you may feel like there's a lot of stuff going on up here, but there's a lot of stuff like sounds like it's going on behind me or off to the side. And it's like, it's wild. And how do you pick out where the guitarist is? Because it's bleeding from the left and the right, like at the same time. It's hard to know exactly what's going on, but when you play it back in Audacity and look at it with the Ozone Imager, you can see what's going on by the map. And I just, like, I really think that's a great feature. And, and I wish I could remember who told me about that. I want to say it was actually uh, Clifton Keplinger. And so if Cliff, if you're watching this, man, I appreciate you giving me the heads up on this because I think you were the one who introduced me to this some years back. And it's been great to have that information. So I think maybe I got one more or a couple more, maybe. This, I can't pronounce this. Hey, Mele No Lilo from the Lilo and Stitch soundtrack. It's pretty cool. There's a chorus of children singing at the same time as the lead singer. That, that, that bass is awesome to hear. And that's another thing to listen for if you're trying to find resonance in a speaker or in an enclosure or in a car. Because it's it's most, I mean, short of listening to tones, really, which I do, short of listening to tones, that's another song to listen for to find those kind of resonances. The other thing that I like about this track is you'll hear, it's like call outs. You'll hear, whoop, 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 and it, like at the beginning. So we just play it. Comes. Hey, so it, there's initial sound that's on the right and then it's like panned right and then it sounds to me like at least the headphones right now it's a little bit left of center it's hard to say for sure but let's Yeah, even that, it's, it's, so I love, this is what I love about listening back to music with a critical mindset, like what, listening for certain things. So you hear the initial right, and then it sounds like there's some information left of center, not like between left and center, but just left of center. But it's also, there's, there's other things going on to the left of center. So it's not just, doesn't sound like it's just one voice there. Almost, I can't tell if it's one person and their voice is like moving, however it's being recorded, or if it's two separate people because it's very distinct, two different places, left of center and then just a little bit more left of center. It's like in this little small area. So ah, this is the stuff I dig, y'all. I'm telling you. Uh, whiplash by the Swampers. Whoa. Swampers. Muscle Shoals Sound. Swampers. Just a jam track. So, yeah, I think that's kind of it for the things that I'm listening for, listening to. Certainly there's more, but this is really just kind of a hint at it. And I guess I'll end the video with that. I, I just want to say thank you all for sticking around. And I hope you able to walk away with some music, some ideas of some things to listen for. If you've got any particular test tracks of your own that you enjoy and why, Leave them in the comments below. I'm sure everybody else would be interested in knowing as well.
That's it. Yeah. I'm going to have to edit this video down and try to get rid of all that initial talking at the beginning of this. But I do appreciate you all watching this far. And like I said, I hope you learned something. I hope you appreciate it. And if you have any questions, ask. And maybe I'll do one of these a little bit later. I've got other tracks to listen to. So, and uh, yeah, that's it. I'll talk to you all later. Take care. Peace.